Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Hillside Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Sean Hall, and we're thrilled that you could join us. Even if not together in person, we are still united by the power of the Spirit and united in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I thank you for joining us. And whether you're a longtime friend or first-time visitor, welcome home. We believe that gather together in worship is where we belong, and so we're glad to gather together today. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Remember, we have a session meeting tomorrow evening. If you are on session, join us by phone. You should have received an email as a reminder, but uh, just as another reminder. Also, if you're in need of anything, if you need someone to run to the grocery store for you, if there's any way we at the church can be of service, please don't hesitate to call. Finally, we remind ourselves the reason we gather for worship in this place is because the God who created the entire universe is at work in our lives And so in this time, even though we're at home, even though it might seem more casual, I invite you to seriously join us in a time of worship. Set aside all distractions, sit up a little straighter as you hear the music of the prelude drawing you into the presence of God, that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. We remind ourselves that it is the Lord himself who calls us to worship, through his, whether through his words of scripture, whether through his, the calling of his Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would join me in the call to worship. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us worship the God who always keeps his promises. Would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the countless blessings that you have given us, most of all for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose, that we might have a hope of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, and an inheritance in your glorious kingdom. Lord, for your faithfulness to past generations, your faithfulness here now, and the promises that you have made for our future, we give you thanks and praise. And we praise you for our presence here among us, and the promise that where two or three are gathered, You are there with us. So we claim that promise as we gather together now and ask that you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit, that you would strengthen us and sustain us beyond what technology or the situations might allow, that your Spirit would be at work in our lives. In all this we pray 
and ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So please take a moment to silently confess your sins before we join together in unison. And Lord, hear us as we pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you as we should. You call us back, but we have not listened. You love us enough to call us friends and include us in your plans for the good of the world, but we remain preoccupied with our own plans that we think are good for us. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, receive forgiveness, and serve you through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
first scripture lesson today and second scripture lesson also are taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 24. So hear now the word of the Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and taking with each other, talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, for their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? And he asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some, of our, some women of our group astounded us. They went to the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back, and told us that they indeed had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, too vast and astounding to tell. Forever existing in worlds above, now offered and given to all. O fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient and endlessly gentle. Grace that you entered our brokenness. 
The second scripture reading picks right up where the first left off as we continue our lesson from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told how what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Lord, if I say anything that is not of your will, may it fall to the ground and be quickly forgotten. But Lord, may you, when you speak your word to your people, may you write it in our hearts and change our lives forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this passage, I think we see a microcosm of the entirety of Christian life. Uh, there's so much here that we just don't have time to talk about all of it, but there's something pervasive that I think we have to talk about. And that's the topic of spiritual blindness. How is it that these disciples who were part of the group, who knew intimately what Jesus looked like, <laughs> could have missed the reality in front of them? I, 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 how is it that we can be just as spiritually blind in our own lives? I, I think the first message of the text is just how easy it is for, to, for us to miss the spiritually obvious. The Bible repeatedly and constantly talks about us as sheep. Spiritually, we just are, have such narrow focus. We focus on what's right in front of us. We can never see the big picture. And Jesus is referred to as the Good Shepherd. But here we have a literal story of people who knew Jesus, and they missed it. They missed the resurrection. They, they missed... <laughs> they, they forgot Jesus' teaching, saying that he would rise again. So here they are. We find them in this story, walking away dejected. And uh, we, they're walking away, uh, away from Jerusalem, away from everything, even after the angel, the message the angel had given the women was to tell them, go, tell my disciples to wait, there I will meet them. And they're walking away. It can't be true. <laughs> Might as well go home, give up this, this great leader. We, we, all of the language that they use when they were explaining to Jesus what had happened, it's all in the past tense. There was a prophet. There, he, we had hoped. Uh, there was no hint in their eyes that there's anything more to be done other than walk home and give up. But how often is that true of us? They're so focused on the bad news of the day. They're so focused on the recent events, current events. Oh, don't you know the news? Don't you know the story? All these bad things happened that they miss that God is doing something amazing in their presence. I think we are, we are exactly like these two disciples. We get so focused on the bad news. We get focused on the number of infections, the coronavirus deaths. We, we get focused on all of the negative things going on in the world that we miss the amazing and magnificent things that God is doing in our midst. But the amazing thing in this story is that the risen Christ was walking with them. Uh, they missed it, but God had already acted for their salvation, had already granted them new life 
before that they even knew or realized that they needed his salvation. I think all too often the truth is that we and they, we don't see the risen Christ at work in our lives because we don't expect to see him. We read the stories of the scripture like it's a lesson about living a moral life, but that all of the characters died a long time ago. (laughs) But the message of the resurrection shatters that. Jesus can't remain in the past. Uh, He he simply can't because we believe that he is alive. Uh, Our call to worship today, great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, died in the past. Christ is risen, present tense, and Christ will come again. Jesus' resurrection consumes, uh, not only is it a past lesson, but it's 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 current events, and it's the future we look forward to. So where is the risen Christ in this story? Well, obviously, on the one sense, he's walking along with them, and they miss the point, but the lesson for us is that how often is the risen Christ at work in our lives when we don't recognize him? So where is it that we should be looking for the risen Christ, and how is it that we can find him? Because the message of the scripture today is that he is alive and is walking among us in ways that we don't always see or understand. The first point, I think, is is just that as they were walking along, Jesus came along and started walking beside them. What does that mean for our lives? As we are going along, Jesus comes alongside of us. The the good news of the gospel is that as far as we are from God, as as preoccupied as we become with current events, as, as, as wrapped up as we get in our own stuff, in our own lives, Jesus comes alongside of us. Not because we're so holy, not because our eyes are so open, not because we're such good people that we clearly get it, not that we're spiritual, but simply Jesus enters into our lives. Uh, The message of the Incarnation, Jesus left his glory and entered into the world to be amongst us. Uh, And Jesus comes along in ordinary, everyday means. Walking, not floating, not levitating, not with miraculous signs, but just walking alongside us in such a way that it's easy to miss. (laughs) I, I would say that sometimes Jesus, we notice Jesus most when we slow down a little bit. I feel like that's one of the good th- one of the good things that I see as good news about all of the country being shut down is that we move at such a fast pace that we often miss that Jesus is walking alongside us. Our culture goes at 60 miles an hour. We're constantly driving and we're overscheduled and we're accessing information at the literally the speed of light. And Jesus' ministry on earth is so often walking. It's so often just at at, three miles an hour taking a stroll down the street, when we slow down enough, we might just notice that Jesus is in places that we might not have noticed, that we might not have thought to look at when we just take our eyes off the screen and look at the people walking beside us, look at the world around us. Second, uh, so if Jesus is present uh, walking alongside of us, then second of all, he's present in the scriptures. This is possibly the most profound spiritual truth, and the greatest sermon ever preached is not revealed in scripture, but Jesus himself opened up the scriptures, illuminated his disciples with the good news of how he is present on every line, and especially how all of the scriptures point to him, and, and, and point out all of these things that had to have happened in order for God to affect our salvation. So if you're looking for Jesus in your life, do you take time to read God's word? Do you take time to dwell in the scriptures? Because in those pages, I promise you, he is present. And, and perhaps most profoundly, So first, he's present walking along. He's present. Second, he's present in the scriptures. And third, he's present in the breaking of the bread. It's it is when the bread is broken that their eyes are opened and they recognize him. Now, these are everyday simple things that God uses to reveal profound 
life-changing spiritual truths. God uses the ordinary, everyday means of grace to change our lives. When we encounter him in ordinary, everyday, those ordinary, everyday actions. But I want to take a moment and dig a little deeper into the breaking of the bread. There's something profound that happens in the breaking of bread. There's something about sharing a meal with somebody that is especially powerful. So often, I think our culture moves at such breakneck speed that a meal becomes something rushed between events. It becomes something quick that we need to shovel down so we can get on to the next thing, so that we can do our homework, so that we can get the email sent, the text messages read, the article that we've been wanting to get to, the TV show. But meals are something that's designed to be a break from the day. It's designed to to slow down, to talk with the people in our lives, to encounter them in a meaningful way. And it's interesting, in in the breaking of the bread, just as it's a reference to the communion meal, as Jesus breaks the bread, his body is broken for us, and yet as, as his body is broken for us, he becomes alive and present and real in our lives. I think the breaking of bread here is symbolic of the deeper need for Christian community. God calls us to live in community with each other. It's one of the reasons that this quarantine is so infuriating, that we feel this need, this itch, especially as the weeks have gone on, the more it grows, that we were designed to live and interact with other people. And the more isolated we become, even as much as we try to join together, there's something missing in our lives when we aren't able to break bread together when we aren't able to join in Christian community. Because it's in the Christian community, it's in coming together in fellowship, in sharing food together, in sharing the Lord's table together. That's when Christ becomes most alive. Mealtime is profoundly formative. We come to worship and we are fed and nourished by the reading of God's word, by the proclamation of his gospel. But coming to worship is a -a once-a-week kind of thing, whereas eating a meal is a 21 times a week kind of thing. And in every meal, we recognize the sacrifice. We give thanks that God has provided. In every meal, something had to die in order for you to be sustained. Whether it was an animal, whether it was a stock of grain, something died so that you could be made alive. And Jesus understands there's something profound and symbolic in this action. Because Jesus died that we might be made alive in him, that he might sustain and nourish us by the breaking of his body, by his death on the cross. And yet by his resurrection, we have hope for new and enduring life that goes far beyond anything we could have ever hoped or imagined. In the breaking of the bread, Jesus reveals himself in a profound and meaningful way. But I wonder just how much we are like the disciples in this story. How easy is it for us to relate to them? They're dejected. We had hoped that he would be the one to change the world. I think the message for us is that, are you without hope today? Have you, are you missing something in your life? Are you too distracted by all the events of the world to see where the living Christ is at work? Are you in need of a second chance? Are you in need of redemption? The good news of this gospel is that because Jesus rose from the grave, he's walking alongside of us. That wherever you are in life, however dejected, however broken you are, healing is possible. However frazzled you are, however at the end of your rope, Jesus offers us new life. He offers us redemption. He offers us a seat at his table in the heavenly kingdom. He offers you the bread. He offers you his body broken for you. I pray that we would take time to recognize that Jesus is walking alongside of us, that we would slow down enough to encounter him in our lives and that we would rejoice for all that he has done Friends, this gospel is available available for each and every one of us thanks to the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Will you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the ways in which you have shown your love to us, not least of all for your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, without his resurrection, we would be dead in our sins. We would be lost in despair. Our lives would be broken apart indeed. And we would be overwhelmed by the news of the day. But thanks to your resurrection, we know that this life is not all that there is. Thanks to your resurrection, we know that you are not stuck in some faraway land. You are not trapped in the stories of these pages, but that you are alive, walking beside us, at work in our lives. And in this, we give you thanks and praise. But still, we live in a broken and fallen world. And we know there are so many people who are in need of your love and care, and we lift them up to you now. Lord, we pray for all those around the world who are battling illness of any kind. We thank you for the people that you have gifted. What, a, what an answer to prayer that modern medicine is and how you have been at work to answer so many prayers in so many ways. Lord, your grace does not go unnoticed, and we return to you thanks and praise. We also ask that you would be with our world leaders, that you would grant them wisdom to govern in a way that is just and merciful and honoring to you. We ask that you would be with our local communities, our friends and families and neighbors, those we know of in our own lives who are in need of your love and care. We lift them up to you now. Lord, we have started to hear stories of people who have died recently, friends of friends and others who have fallen ill, and we lift them up to you now. We ask that you would comfort those who mourn. We pray that you would struggle, or that you would be with those struggling, that you would bless those who are recovering from surgery, for those who are just at the end of their rope. Lord, grant them the peace that passes understanding. And Lord, in all things, we give you thanks and praise. I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all those within the sound of my voice, that you would strengthen them, encourage them, that they would bear your light wherever they go, and that they would show kindness to everyone they encounter. Lord, in all this, we give you thanks and praise, and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in the service when we would normally respond to all the grace that God has shown us through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we encourage you to continue giving to the church, to continue supporting any and all charitable organizations. We encourage you to buy gift certificates from businesses that are hurting, to help out friends in need however we can. We respond and reflect and give back to God all that we have. So in this time, we pray that you would offer your hearts, most of all, your bodies, minds, and souls back to God in worship as we sing the doxology together. pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all the gifts that you have given us, especially in times of want and times of need. It is important for us to stop and remember all the ways that you have been faithful in the past, to remember that everything that we do have is a gift from you, and to take time to praise you for all that you've been given, all that we've been given. Lord, we pray that you would accept the humble offering we bring, 
that you would multiply it, use it for the sake of your kingdom work here on earth and in all things. Your will might be done on earth and your name glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. today, remember that the risen Christ is alive and at work in our midst, and often in the most simple and humble of ways, walking alongside of us, present in the scripture we read, and in the breaking of bread with those we love. And remember to share this good news with all those you meet, and as you go, receive this blessing. May the hands of Christ tend your every wound, may the Holy Spirit breathe in your ears just the things you need to hear. And may God the Father receive you into his everlasting arms at the last. Amen.